I guess uh, if we're going to start on time, we should uh, probably start this conversation. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is John Blair, and uh, I uh, head up the state uh, of California team with SAP. Um, and I uh, thank you for attending this this session today. One of the things that we're going to we're going to talk to you about today is, uh, I think, one of the uh, best things about this conference is that we are not trying to talk product specific. Um, certainly. Uh, there's there's products out there. There's there's tools. There's there's hardware. There's all these different components, but the the bottom line is the the journey to big data is is a is an arduous one. You know, I mean, don't let anybody tell you that this is going to be easy, because if they if they're telling you you know it's easy and we've done this and we've done that, uh, that's not true. It is straightforward. Um, at SAP, we have a number of, uh, of uh, customers, and, and we're you know over a thousand now that are using our big data solution. But believe me, it's all about architecture. It's about planning. It's about uh, trying to figure out the strategic uh, method that you're you're trying to uh, strategic uh, ideas that you're trying to, to uh, uh, obtain out of your your big data uh, solutions. It's a big big journey. Okay. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about you know the methodology that at SAP that we use. You know it's interesting, and you'll have to excuse the 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 uh, uh, metaphor, but uh, you know big data uh, is is kind of like a dating in high school. Uh, everybody's talking about doing a lot of things, but not everybody's really doing anything. You know, so so it's a it's a it's an arduous journey. And what we're going to try and talk to you a little bit about is we're going to tell you about some of our customers how they're how they're doing it today. Um, you know some of the uh, uh, activities and some of the um, uh, some of the results of some of the the big data projects that have been uh, implemented uh, for our customers and then lastly you know kind of to give you some guidance on how to get started uh, on the uh, on your own journey because I guarantee you that that big data and and one of the benefits of being a uh, uh, in public sector is it's a lagging industry I came from lagging industry uh, uh, businesses and the good news is you can learn a lot from everybody else's mistakes, right? And uh, so we're going to try and help you on that journey, tell you some of the things that, that have worked really well, and, uh, and, and we'll talk to you a little bit about the things that aren't going so well, uh, you know, and some, some mistakes that some, some people have made. I'd like to introduce to you Paul Flynn. Uh, Paul is uh, uh, my counterpart on the analytics side uh, that I work with with the state of California. Uh, he, um, uh, he's been uh, in the uh, data business a long, long time. And he's uh, kind of a fixture with, uh, within the, the data community. And uh, we have uh, uh, Chi uh, Su, who is, uh, quite frankly, um, our go-to architect uh, in the big data group. And uh, he's been uh, with uh, SAP a relatively short period of time, uh, but he was brought over specifically to work um, in, in the big data solution set in the architecture. Um, and before that, he's, uh, he was with uh, Teradata. So we're not talking product specific. We're talking about, we're talking about the journey to big data. And I hopefully uh, you'll uh, get something out of this. This is interactive as we go through it. If you have questions at, at the end, please let, let us know. And, and uh, hopefully we can, we can help you uh, answer any questions you may have. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Chief. All right, thank you, sir. All right, so a uh, little bit of the uh, agenda. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a little bit of uh, talking about high level, about the big data challenge and the opportunities. And then we'll get in a little bit, as John said, about some of our customer use cases, how they have worked with big data and gotten value out of it. Uh, and then lastly, talk a little bit about our approach to big data. Okay. So, all right. So the thing about big data, going, you know, rewinding the clock by about 60 years, right? Big data back in 1943 in the public sector, right? FBI had over 100 million fingerprint files, and they had tens of thousands of law documents. How do they do analytics? They had humans, right? Go through the files. And that's how you did big data back then. And I'm actually not going to talk about this example. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is that Director Johnson and Secretary Lane this morning mentioned in the state of California, we have 50 petabytes of healthcare data. 90% of that was generated in the last two years, and the projected growth rate is doubling every six months. So just think about that. That's a huge amount of data. And you know, what can we get out of it? What kind of insights can we get out, of, get out of that, right? That's the question. How do we harness that massive, massive amount of data? And how do we integrate that data with you know, because we're, we're not just talking about healthcare. Healthcare is a significant part of the government sector, but it's not it, right? There's all these other agencies that, that have all kinds of interactions with the citizens that we serve. So how do we integrate all of those together? Okay, so 
big data. The original definition came in 2001 by the Meta Group, which subsequently became part of Gartner's. Right? So that was originally the three Bs, volume, large amounts of data, velocity, the speed of data, new data that's being generated, and also variety. Right? So back then, it was more about, okay, so I have structured data and unstructured data, meaning things like text. Right? But we, what we think you know, it actually needs to be a lot more granular today in the current world of big data. So, you know, a lot of volume, right? So not only there's large volume data, and that number has grown, and actually, you know, Secretary Ling went into the details of the, the megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, exabytes, and zettabytes, and so on, right? But also, now there's new paradigms, right? You have things such as Hadoop as a secondary storage and analytic platform. How do you integrate that with your existing tools and data systems? Now, variety, right? So it's no longer just, okay, I have a structured versus an unstructured text, right? It's a lot more data types now. Right. I have things, for example, geospatial data. Think about the Charleston case of the water pollution, the water uh, contamination in, the, in the, on the East Coast. Right. So you have data about your water treatment plants that says you know they are at this lat long, and there's some data sets out there saying here are chemi chemical plants, here are you know other plants that are potentially contaminant sources. They all have lat longs. Could somebody just write a query that says, find me all water plant, water treatment plants that are within five miles of a chemical plant of this type, right? And then that will be our government watch list, and then every, you know, regularly we should go and inspect those plants, right? So that's a very interesting kind of, kind of data and interesting kind of analysis that you can do today. And other things you know, such as you know, social media, right? To say, okay, so what are our, our citizens talking about this is not just, you know, okay, so on the, uh, you know, uh, in the city of Sacramento's page, page, well, Facebook page, what are people saying, right? Or, you know, what are people tweeting to the city's uh, you know, Twitter handle to say, you know, I have a particular issue, there's a pothole on my street, right? It's much more widespread than, than that. So can we aggregate all that information to say, you know, are people happy with the service of a particular agency, right? And what are the most pressing issues? Can we aggregate that to say the top five issues the citizens care about are this? Uh, things like you know, m uh, machine data, right? So think about all the data that we have today, and actually, the government, state government's already done some of that, especially in DOT, right? Think about, you know, we are checking traffic, you know, the Google, not only Google, but think about a lot of the Google data actually comes from the state government. Before we go ski in Tahoe, we will check the DOT website to say, okay, you know, how does the road look to Tahoe? You know, is there a problem in Truckee before, you know, before I go out there? Can we take that much further to see all the other sensor data that we have in place? That are, you know, that, are, that are data that are being uh, generated in state government state agencies. So there's a lot of, not only the different data types, but we have to think about more from an IT perspective, what are all the different data systems I need to get it, and how do I get it added, right? And actually our, our colleagues at the, uh, uh, our friends at the Department of Corrections and also at Oracle talked about that in a previous session about some of the challenges of, you know, even working in that case within a single agency, the challenges of getting data from multiple disparate sources, these, some of these are relational databases, some of these are Excel files and access files that are sitting on my desktop, right? And, and you know, how do, how do you get all of that together? Uh, and you know, multi, uh, there, there are data characteristics about you know, how frequent, how, how um, you know, is this data hot, more recent, and high value versus warm and cold, that you know, I have this 10 year old data that I might need to analyze maybe once a year and so on. So velocity, right? Velocity is not only that data growth, you know, such as the healthcare data growing, doubling every six months, but also how fast is the data coming in? Right, so you know, how many Medi-Cal claims do I have coming in a day? Right? Think about all the government websites. How many clicks do I get in a single hour, in a single minute, across all the agencies? Right? And real-time decisioning is that, okay, so can I very quickly detect that a particular citizen has, you know, based on interactions through different agencies, social service agencies, healthcare agencies, and so on, understands that he is at risk to about to go homeless in the next two weeks due to his circumstances or that this particular elderly person is at risk for, you know, heart disease, for readmission into the hospital within 30 days, right? So from a prevention perspective, we should actually, instead of just wait for him to come show up, and because this person is uninsured, wait for him to show up in the ER and have a very costly, uh, you know, service that the state has to pay for, can we do something more preventive by, you know, sending out a nursing aide to his home to say, okay, you know, so, uh, you know, we want to check up on you every day, because that's, in the end, in the big picture, is to be more cost effective. Uh, vision to insight, right? There are different kinds of advanced analytics, and actually already touched on some of those, such as geospatial looking at location data. There are other things such as predictive, right? That we talked actually the keynote talked about this morning about making predictions. And so another, the, some of these examples, and also uh, Director Ramos in the video keynote this morning talked about: Can we be like consumer product companies and market to our citizens 
just like they do to us as, as consumers about, okay, you know, here's a change in, uh, here's a particular life change you just had and you're about to buy a house, so I'm gonna market you a mortgage product or I'm gonna market you furniture. And similarly, can we do that to our citizens to say, okay, you're about to retire, so I'm going to talk, market to you some you know, brochures about you know, retirement services, healthcare services, senior services, and so on that are relevant to you because I know, for example, exactly where you live, what are all the agency offices that are close to you, and maybe even proactively to book you some appointments to induce you to go. Right? So all of them, that is the synthesis of not just that I'm in a siloed way, I'm doing predictive. I have a data scientist doing predictive. I have a guy who is doing geospatial analysis. But the value is that can I integrate all of those together? Right? That's where even the most interesting things happen when I do more, more of them together. Uh, you know, and so the synthesis of different kind of analysis is also the synthesis of different types of data. Right? So if I can integrate the social media data about what citizens are doing, what individuals are doing, with the transactional data I'm getting from the different touch points that citizen has with different agencies, to you know things like geolocation data, and do all of this analysis process various rich types of data. Okay. So this is SAP's prediction for big data for 2014. So the first one is domain specific. So what does that mean? Right. So what that is talking about is that there's gonna be new problems that are coming aboard that were, this problem didn't exist before. And so there are gonna be specific solutions to solve some of these problems. So let's think about Netflix, right? So probably many of us here have subscriptions to Netflix. What does Netflix have? They have extremely rich data about what we watch, right? So it knows I've seen the whole season of House of Cards, right? And it knows that I watched that in one day. So, okay, but beyond that, right? not just that, okay, it knows you know, all of these things and the volume is way bigger than what Blockbuster or anybody else ever had. But think about, they know that, okay, I watched this particular segment, I paused, I thought it was very interesting, I rewound and rewatched it two more times. So that's very interesting data that, you know, that, that's very, that they can use for marketing purposes. They also know that I paused at a particular point in time and then I went off for two minutes. Maybe I went to the bathroom, maybe I went to get coffee, right, that they don't know. But you know, think about that grain of data. So for example, the first example of the clip that I watched again, maybe thousands of people also watched that clip. So they can make a business decision to say, okay, let's take that clip and use that as our promo clip and put it on YouTube. Maybe it'll go viral and cause more and more people to come to Netflix to watch that. Okay. Think about you know, this kind of example, how can we apply that you know, to, you know, to the gov state government? Think about the agency we have and hundreds and thousands of websites we have all over the place, all the touch points at the you know, DOT office, and the health and human services offices and so on and so forth, can we integrate all of that data, right? We have a very rich picture of the interaction with a particular citizen, right? So this is where we can, we can you know, potentially achieve some of the vision that Dir Director Ramos had about, you know, a day, you know, in theory, you can actually know that, you know, I, you know, I don't have a kid yet, but you know, when I do, in 16 years, I take my kid to the DOT, to the DMV office and to, to take a driver's license exam, right? So then they know that's a lifestyle change at that point of my while my kids are starting to drive. And they probably know that two years after that, that kid is probably gonna go to college, right? So what are the things that state government agencies can offer to me as a parent, right? You know, think it's about, okay, so I, I, I got a mortgage title, right? So you know, the, the county property office knows that, okay, I own a property now. So what are the things that the agencies can offer to me that will, compel, that will be compelling to me, right? I'm sure there are many, many services out there that I don't even know about Right? Unless you know my friends tells me on Facebook or something like that, right? Can we be more proactive about offering these services to our to the taxpayers, our you know our, our uh, stakeholders? Uh, the next one is more IT focused, right? Which is SQL on the loop. So this is a little bit about more skill set that Secretary Lane talked about earlier. He said one of the well, the, the skill set challenge she talked about was more focused on number five data scientists. But you know, similar here is that. Hadoop skill set, from an IT perspective, is very it's very hard to get. It's a very specialized skill set, and there's huge demand for it in industry as well as you know all, all in all other sectors, public sectors as well. So and so that's you know, it's very expensive to hire, and and so what we're seeing is that the technology vendors are starting to go down the route where you're implementing SQL-based solutions on top of Hadoop to make Hadoop easier to harness, and easier to manage, and easier to do analysis on. So we're starting to see trends in that area. Uh, and then the, I'll jump a little bit forward to cloud, right? So this is, you think about uh, the evolution of cloud, right? So you're seeing that in, enter in business enterprise, many applications are being moved to the cloud that we would never imagine 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, we probably never imagined that, oh, you know, I'm gonna put HR application onto the cloud. Who would have imagined that? And, but you know, that is happening today. And so similarly, we're gonna see that 
big data applications, whether it is platform solutions for analytics or actually turnkey solutions to solve a specific business problem, are going to be starting to move, start going to start to move to the cloud. So number three, predictive, and number five, data scientists are very closely tied together. Right? So predictive is where you're using the science, uh, using the science in terms of the algorithms to make predictions about things, right? And so this is not just that I'm predicting about the future, but also I'm doing data mining against the present to see what are the patterns, right? To see, that, okay, you know, people who, uh, let's say, you know, go to get a driver's license, they tend to also, I tend to also see that they visit another agency for something else that's, you know, I would never expect it to be, to be a coincidence, to be a correlation. Right? If I can analyze that across two agencies, multiple agencies' data to be able to mine that correlation. Uh, and then the, how do you solve a predicted problem? And the most common so the way to do that is by, of course, first of all, you need technology solutions. And then second of all, you need people to implement those solutions. And that's where the data scientists come in, right? And so um, we talked this, this morning that um, Secretary Lane talked about, you know, we should, everyone should try to be you know, more data science, to be, think like a data scientist. And so and she talked about some of the skill sets there for data scientists, things like the analytical frame of mind, algorithm background in math and statistics, as well as things, traits such as curiosity, creativity, attention to, you know, focus, attention to detail, and so on. So, you know, this, as a profession, just like the Hadoop skill set, is very specialized. These are people who often have PhDs and, ma and master's degrees in computer science, statistics, mathematics, right, that you know, understand how to harness these algorithms and also have had the experience of working with data for their customers in a variety of different industries, right? So they understand data and they understand more, and most importantly, why I say the analytical, uh, analytical skill set is that they can think, right? They're thinking about what are the questions to ask? What are the questions to pose? They're gonna ask you, okay, you know, what data do you have? Do you have XYZ data? Have you thought about incorporating external data like social media data? Have you thought about incorporating census data to this particular problem, right? And then they're gonna apply the scientific process of experimentation to try you know, different, different types of algorithms and you know, try different ways of shaping and massaging the data to, and try to come out with different solutions and figure out what is the best solution for this particular problem. And so this is a very specialized skill set that's also very expensive to hire for. And what we're seeing is that increasingly there are vendors that are offering this skill set as a service. And SAP is one of those as well, is that we have long had a group of data scientists on staff that we offer to our, uh, to our customers to help them solve specific business problems. And I'll talk a little bit about that service a little bit later. Okay. Okay, some of the challenges, right? So the number of challenges here, right? So this is that big data, right? Everything, everybody thinks it's, you know, it's very hot because everybody's talking about it. But you know, there are a lot of technology vendors out there. You know, if you look at all the big, uh, big uh, uh, data management vendors, everybody says, I do something that's big data. And so, you know, what, but then, and there are also tons and tons of startups that are starting up to say, you know, I am big, I'm, I offer a big data solution, whether it's a platform or it's actually a point solution to solve a problem. So where do you start, right? So that's, all, that's always a question that we see. Um, and things like cost, right? To say, especially being in the public sector, we're budget constraints, right? So where do I invest to get the big bang, biggest bang for my buck? Staffing and skill set really, you know, I already talked about quite a bit on the last slide. Uh, you know, and, and then the insight, right? So not only that I need a platform to, uh, and also the staffing to get the insight, but then what do I do with that insight? And this is where the yeah, Secretary Lane talked about communication, right? So we need to get, once you get the insight, how do you, act, how do you act on it, right? Take action on that insight. And that requires changing the process, right? And you know, for, our, for our business customers, that's, that's the business process. And for you guys, it's really you know, thinking about your day-to-day -day process in the government about, you know, how do I act on these? You know, I have these 25 reports that are a result of some data scientist doing a you know, week or a month of work. How do I act on that, right? So beyond just disseminating this report to all the relevant whole stakeholders in 20 different agencies, right, how do I affect change, right? So when you think about that. And data governance, right, that's also a big issue is that, you know, I have all of these different data systems. How do I manage the data that's coming in here, right? It's not, and also, how do I make sure data is clean? It's good quality. I might have a fantastic, platform and great data scientists, but if the data that's coming in is not good, I'm just getting faster garbage. Right. So, um, okay. All right, so uh, this is a little bit about kind of our five axes, the kind of the attributes of the, from a platform perspective, what are the, what are, for platform solutions, what are the things you need, right? So first is broad, right? We need to be able to handle not only the volume data, but 
all the different data types that I mentioned, things like structure, tag, uh, structure, unstructured like text, geospatial, and so on. So, right? So you need to be able to ask very complicated questions, now, not only easy questions, but also very complicated questions, right? So example, you know, I gave, I gave up earlier about you know, what are the uh, you know water treatment plants that are within five miles of chemical plants. That's you know that's one particular kind of question, right? And go much more complicated than that. And then real time and high speed are very closely related these two dimensions. Right, thinking about so okay, so I need to be able to ingest data very quickly because it could be something like a web, uh, you know, web scenario where think about the aggregate traffic all the agencies get. Right, that's massive amounts of data. How can I ingest that very quickly? And then the second aspect is okay, once I have data in some platform, what do I do with it? Right, which is actually two stages. The first stage is analytics, right, where I'm trying to get the insight. How can I answer analytical questions very quickly? And then the next step is okay, so once I have analytics about you know, for example, building a model of how can I build a model that accurately predicts when someone is about to retire based on a whole bunch of different data sets. So that, that's the first part is the analytical. And the next part is action, right? So as data is coming in every day, every hour, every minute, how do I act on it and just say, oh, okay, you know, this guy, uh, you know, this guy Joe, he is about to retire, right? And then, so then, then act on that to say, okay, now here is the, the, the action, which is that, okay, so, you know, these five agencies should send him an email uh, you know, talking about their services. And these two offices need to make appointment for him to you know, go see them about retirement benefits because he is a state worker, about his, his pension benefits. Uh, simplicity also, I would call that agility. Right? So you know, I might have a platform that I'm gonna sell you and you know, it's, it's powerful and all that, but what if it takes you, you know, army of consultants and takes you two years to implement, right? That's not, very, that's not a very good solution. What you need is a solution that you can quickly deploy and quickly get time to value. If you think about traditional data warehouse and data mark solutions, it takes a long time to deploy, right? You gotta do all kinds of things of data modeling, and you gotta build all kinds of data structures to improve performance, and build all kinds of reports, and so on and so forth. How can we accelerate that process, right? To give you quicker time to value. Okay. So hopefully, uh, so now we're shifting gears a little bit, talking about some of the actual big data use cases. Right? The first one is that we've worked with the state of Indiana uh, with their child and welfare services. And so what their goal is, is to re specifically, they have a very specific goal, right? So, you know, Secretary uh, Lane talked about a very broad initiative of a healthy California. So think of this as, you know, back, but the very, very limited scope of a specific goal in that, in a similar kind of initiative of we need to reduce infant mortality because Indiana was leaking, leaking other, was lagging other, sta uh, other states. And so what we have done is that there's really a two key wins here. First is that we're able to help them integrate a lot of different longitudinal data sources across government agencies, right? So it's not just that, okay, I need to get data from, you know, let's say the equivalent of health and human services agency, right? There's all kinds of other agencies, for example, the child welfare agencies, the human, you know, the other, and so on and so forth, right? Not just the health, but also the social service aspect and potentially other data sources. You need to integrate all of those and put them into a single system that you can analyze. And so that's the first thing that allows you to do the next step of analytics. And so the next step is actually applying some of these predictive techniques, you know, with data science resource, data scientist resources. And in this specific case, that came up, that came up from a, uh, a partner that we were using, that we had, we had working with the state of Indiana, to apply some of these algorithms to be able to come up with these propensity models to say, okay, you know, this particular person, Bob, he is at high risk, or you know, this child, Bob, is at high risk for, you know, for, for you know, for uh, let's say, you know, truancy or something like that. And, you know, what, what, and then understanding you know, what are some of the root causes that drive some of these issues, social issues. Right? Uh, and then you know, the, and then the result is that once you combine those two, then you can recommend changes proactively, right? So is that when, as the case comes in, applying some of these analytics that you have learned beforehand by doing historical data mining, then you can act to say, okay, for this particular, you know, bait, for this particular infant, we need to recommend these kind of set of steps that, in the past, with similar children, have proved to improve the. Uh, you know, the life, the life expectancy of child and it reduced infant mortality. Okay. Uh, the next one is the agency, social service agency in New York City. So there's 70,000 children, uh, 70,000 children and families that they are, uh, they're responsible for, right? So the first step, again, is very similar to the use case we just talked about, is that first is that we need to be able to ingest a, a longitudinal view, 360 view. In enterprises, you think about a, cu a customer 360, right? I, I need to understand from a customer relationship perspective, what are all your interactions with me, the retailer, let's say, right? You know, are you on, the web, on your web interactions, your phone interactions, your in-store interactions, and so on. And similarly, think about to applying to public sector. 
you also have a lot of different channels of interaction with different agencies, public as well as private, nonprofits, and so on. Can we interject the data of that to have a better view of all the touch points that this particular client has had? And then, then you're able to do real-time monitoring as the data signals are coming in and so that you're able to react to it. So that's the first step is to say, I am able to have a real-time view of everything that's happening as well as the historical. So I know everything that's happened in this case, right? A complete case. Not just, you know, a particular agency has a case file on this child of all that agency's interactions with the child. Uh, this one is a public, uh, with, is a education use case, right? University of Kentucky. So um, what, they're, what they're trying to do is to increase retention, right? Prevent dropout. So there's you know, a number of purposes there in terms of, you know, our educational goal of we want to further education for the public, but also there's also a financial aspect is that when you reduce retention and reduce dropout, that increases tuition you know, revenue, right? So there, there are a number of goals that are in play here. And so again, you know, we're able to integrate data from multiple sources from across the campus for all the different, think about all the different systems that a particular student will interact with, whether it is the, uh, you know, bursar, uh, the, the, uh, the registrar's office for, you know, paying tuition, Think about the uh, you know, housing system, right? They have to pay housing for rent, for you know, for, for for food, and you know, also you know things like social media on campus. So right? say, you know, what are all the touch points and integrating all of that, and again, it's very building a propensity model. Say, what are the what are the students that are at risk for dropout, right? And then doing some data mining to say, for risk students that are at risk for dropout, what are the courses of action that we have taken? You know, for example, to say, oh, you know, for this particular profile of low income. Uh, you know, children who uh, uh, low-income students, we found that giving them a, a proactively offering them a payment plan seems to reduce, you know, reduce dropout rate by like 70%. Right? So then, you know, that might be some, some insight that you discover during the, the data analysis phase. And so then that you would be incorporate part of the business rules as of the, of the action. So the next time a new student comes, a new student case file comes in and you type, okay, so this is high risk then you can say, here's the action, right? The action for this particular, very personalized for this particular student profile is this particular kind of terms uh, on this particular payment plan. Uh, and so the, um, so we don't have any results at the moment, but in terms of the high level business goals, right? So is that they want to increase the graduation rate from 60 to 70% over a 10 year period. And also that, you know, the, the, the business benefit is that every point increase in that, right? Is so that 60 to 70% increase will result in $11 million in additional tuition for the university. Okay, uh, this uh, is a, uh, is a geospatial, this and the next uh, use case are about geospatial, right? So you think about, uh, this is actually um, a uh, fire and uh, rescue agency in Australia. And so what they're doing is basically, you know, they have lots of data about, for example, where their equipment are, right? Think about you know, all the emergency first responders, all the fire trucks, all the ambulances and so on. They all have GPSs on them, right? So that you know where they are. And they're streaming data over the, over the you know, public safety network back to the command center, command and control center. And so they want to be able to understand where equipment are, you know, what is happening to do things like real-time dispatching and so on, taking into account where the pieces of equipment are to optimize for the dispatch right, and the response to service requests. And so they're able to integrate using HANA's uh, uh, SAP's, I'll, I'll talk about HANA later, about SAP, about with using SAP big data platforms, built-in capabilities for geospatial analysis and integrate with their existing infrastructure, which is a from a vendor called Esri, that provides some of these location services. And the next one is a, um, a, a city agency in Asia, where right? they want to look at, you know, this, is a, this is a longer term project. So you think about, okay, so you know, I have, uh, you know, th think about, let's say San Francisco, right? So we all know there's a lot of congestion. So now, and we all know that you know, there's very there's there's limited amount of tolling in terms of bridges, and I think you know there's the media that's going to report that we want to go further in terms of the tolling to actually toll the surface roads as well. So think about you know, if you take that to really you know, the next level, how do you how do you toll right? Because today, you know, the bridge tolls are fairly fixed in terms of yeah on, on the weekends and off hours there's a slight reduction in the tolling, but you need to be you know truly dynamic. Think about that. Which is okay. So not only that, okay, it's, I have a schedule of, you know, let's say 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. It's a certain toll, which is fixed. But really think about it's completely dynamic so that you don't need to worry about, okay, you know, holidays and so on. You see that there's a lot of traffic, then you increase the toll, right? So that's the completely dynamic tolling. And so then, then that will give the public incentive to say, you know, you shouldn't drive into the city because the toll, this dynamic tolling based on this morning's really bad traffic. Of course, in the Silicon Valley, every day seems to be bad traffic, but 
uh, you know, to say that we, we will increase and penalize you for going to the city. So think about you know, that requires a lot of different kinds of data sources from all the traffic monitoring equipment, right, as well as, you know, to, uh, as, you know and, uh, and other data sources that we need to ingest, right, to, to be able to make some of these decisions and also some, a lot of historical analysis to figure out what is the right pricing. You, know, you don't want to just offer like a $20 call, right? That, that's probably a little too extreme, but it's, should it be $20? Should it be $5? Or something in between, right? How do you, how do you come up with that number? And so that requires you to have a platform and also the staffing, the skill set to be able to do some of these experimentation to figure out what is the right level to set some of these tolls. Okay, and so we have about uh, 15 minutes, so I think that'll be perfect. So I'll take about 10 minutes to talk a little bit about SAP's approach. Uh, and so that will leave us with about five to ten minutes for uh, Q&A from the audience. Okay. So uh, SAP's approach is that we are known as a applications company, right? People know SAP as, okay, so the, you know, they sell ERP and they sell CRM applications and so on and so forth. Right? Some people also know SAP as being a vendor for analytics, right? When you sell business object analytics. But you know, few, a lot of people don't really know that SAP has been a player in big data. And so that, you know, there, we have a three-prong uh, three strategy, is that you know, we don't want to just sell you a piece of software and then walk away. We want to help you, because SAP is a business process company. We want to help you solve a business problem. So how do we do that? So the core of that is a powerful platform. And so that's the platform called SAP HANA, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. So that is a single platform that allows you to ingest massive amounts of data and do high-performance analytics on it, do all kinds of rich analytics, you're not getting into that. That's the core is that platform. That's an end-to-end -end platform that allows you to do starting from the moment of easily ingesting data, whether it's physically or through ETL or virtually through data virtualization through all kinds of different sources into this platform, and then doing rich types of analytics inside it. And then the next part is the actioning as well as the consumption. So the second pillar is analytics and applications. So we own business objects, so we provide highly integrated analytics solutions for you to say, I want to disseminate some insight through a dashboard, through email, and so on and so forth, right? So we have methods for you to do that that's highly integrated with our underlying HANA platform. The next one is applications, right? So I can sell you a database. I can sell you a BI tool. Does that solve a problem? No, it doesn't solve a problem because that's just a technical underpinning. It's just a technical tool. Right? To solve a turnkey problem, you still have to do some implementation. So one of our differentiating approaches is that SAP being an applications company is that just as you know, we build applications for ERP and supply chain and so on, we are building big data applications to solve specific problems. Right? Things, for example, in public sector, there's fraud, waste, and abuse. Right? So we have already have our application built for insurance market and we're expanding that to the public sector for fraud, specifically for fraud management. Things like you know, case management, things like predicting fraud and so on and so forth. Right? That's just one example. We're building more and more applications in a number of areas in, uh, for, for uh, enterprises as well as for public sector. And so that, that gives you a turnkey solution to solve a specific business problem. But we can't possibly build thousands of applications that solve every imaginable business problem. Right? So this is where the data science expertise comes in, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as well, is that we offer data scientists service right? so that they have rich experience in terms of the Math and science, math and statistical knowledge, as well as the uh, a bit the experience of working with many different uh, industries and lines of business to solve all kinds of different business problems, right? and we can leverage some of that. And some, so they actually have done a number of uh, amount of quite a bit of work in public sector with things such as fraud, waste, and abuse. And you can actually also leverage some of their work in other areas such as consumer product in terms of marketing to say, let's apply some of that uh, experience to marketing to. Uh, the citizens. Okay. Uh, talking a little bit about SAP HANA, which is our core platform, our core data management and analytics platform. Right? So SAP HANA, is, its differentiator is it's completely in memory, so every, all the data is stored in memory, so that gives you the power and the speed of processing. Right? But, and so what that allows you to do is that in, in a, uh, traditionally you would need to have a transactional database and separately, you would have a data warehouse or data mark to do your analytics. Right? Just because you couldn't do analytics on your transactional system, it wasn't powerful enough. So with HANA, you're able to do all of that in a single place. Right? And then talk a little bit about convergence and optimization. Right? So what does that mean? So what that says is that, so traditionally, you have your 
transactional database, you have your data warehouse, and then if you needed to do predictive analysis, you probably say, okay, I need to go buy, you know, buy a, a advanced analytics tool, right? If I need to do text analysis or social media analysis, I need to go buy yet another tool, right? So you have all of these silos for different types of analysis you want to do to manage different types of data. And then you, the customer, are left with having to own, how do I tie all that together, right? And I have to go pay for the hardware, the software, the staffing to manage all these silos. Right? So there's a data, ch data management challenge as well as the integration challenge. So the philosophy behind HANA is that why not, given the power of HANA, store a single copy of, of all each data set in a single place and do all of these different kinds of rich analytics in a single place. Right? And that's what we have done with that. We have put, I'll talk about that in the next slide, but we have put all of these different types of analytics as basically different engines in the same underlying platform. And then the next step is the, optimize, uh, the optimization is that you think about the traditional application to, uh, model is that you have an application server, a lot of software is there, and a lot of your custom logic for how, how you're interacting with customers and so on is business logic is there. And you have a database tier, right? That also has quite a bit of logic there. And so you have these multiple tiers, this typical three tier architecture of the database, the application server, and the end client. So why not collapse those two backend tiers so that your application is sitting where the data is? So you're pushing all the analytics down from that very thick application layer into the database. So you're doing all these processing in database and all your business logic is being pushed into the database. So you have a very thin analytics layer, a uh, very thin application layer that's actually just a software component sitting on the database server. So that reduces the, that, that, reduces the, that makes your landscape more simple. So talking a little bit about some of the engines that are in HANA. Right? So first of all, in the weekend, as I mentioned, right? HANA all starts, it's a full stack solution, starts from the ingest. Uh, we allow you to ingest data from all kinds of different sources, structure, unstructure, from the view, from other relational database sources, and files, and so on and so forth. And once the data is ingested, you can do all kinds of rich analytics, right? So, so not, of course, all of the traditional SQL things that you can do, you can, you can do in HANA. But beyond that, to say, you know, I can do text search, right? Think about you know, Google kind of text search. Think about text analysis, which includes things like sentiment analysis, right? So if I have a you know, customer email from you know, the, the uh, Department of Natural Resources about you know, they want a permit, right? Can I extract out what is this person talking about? Can I extract out is this person's tone positive or negative about the service, right? And you know, look, look, thinking about that, I mean, what are all the things that that enables? Spatial analysis, I already gave the example about you know, the water treatment plant. There are many other use cases to think about disaster preparedness. You know, there's gonna be a typhoon, or you know, there's gonna be a tsunami, or there's gonna be a, you know, a rainstorm, and I can download the map of that from the weather service about that particular uh, you know, natural phenomenon. Can I overlay that with my population to say, you know, okay, so what are, all, what are the areas that are vulnerable? You know, who are the vulnerable citizens? Or what are all the government facilities that are gonna be impacted by this particular weather phenomenon? Uh, and also the predictive analysis, right? So if you can do advanced analytics of applying algorithms to build some of these use cases we talked about earlier, for example, identifying at-risk individuals, doing that kind of modeling and so on, uh, as well as things you can actually build applications on HANA, right? So you can, you can do that in a single platform in a, using a single front end. Okay. Uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, the simplicity I mentioned, right? So this is you know, what I alluded to earlier, is that in a traditional uh, application landscape, you would have different their own hardware and software and you have skills, you need to have people to manage those. Right? So with HANA, you have a single place to consolidate all of that. And you get not only the speed of HANA, but also faster time to value because you can develop all these things with a single set of guys, right, to manage a single landscape. And then you, know, you need to plug and play what are the different components that you need. Talking a little bit about applications, right? So I mentioned that you know we are taking our applications. So not so. First of all, we're taking our core applications such as ERP and so on, and making them run on HANA, right? So taking optimizations to push down, as I mentioned earlier, pushing down a lot of that logic that previously resided in, for example, ERP, pushing that into the database, so that it's happening closer to the data without having to move data back and forth between the two, so between the application and database. Right? So for optimization, better performance but also new emerging areas that we previously were not tackling, we're building out applications, and I mentioned the example about fraud applications. We're building out these new applications that are big data specific. 
for specific uh, industries and also lines of business. And you know, we enable you, the customer, to leverage HANA to build your own custom applications, right? And this is complete in terms of the backend processing to all the way to the front end, right? So the front end consumption layer, and you're not tied to business intelligence tools, right? You can actually use uh, our tool set to build a custom uh, HTML5 mobile, mobile enabled applications directly out of running directly on HANA. Okay. Uh, this is just the last slide talking about the data science, right? So uh, we have a group of about 70, 70 data scientists globally. So these are PhD level guys. Uh, in background of computer science, statistics, and so on. They have worked with over 125 of our SAP's customers in a variety of industries, including public sector, on a lot of different use cases, right? So these are the guys that have the uh, math and science uh, uh, expertise in terms of algorithms. What are the right algorithms to apply to a particular problem set? And they also have the experience of working with customers in terms of things like communication, asking questions, being analytical, and so on. And they also have the industry knowledge of having to work with these customers. Uh, and, you know, and they will build a solution for our customers that's end-to-end -end solution. Not only that is the analytic solution on top, running on top of HANA, but also a full consumption tier as well. Right? So you're getting something that's a full turnkey solution. Okay, so this is my last slide before we give any questions. Right? So just to, just to uh, recap, so what we're talking about is that three tiers, uh, three tiers that uh, our complete end-to-end -end strategy is that we're going to provide you platforms and the software tools, but we don't stop there, right? So we provide, we also build applications to solve uh, turnkey solutions to solve specific problems. And for everything else, right, we have experts available to help you tackle your problems. And whether it is just, you know, I want to talk about data strategy or I actually have a specific business problem I want to solve using advanced analytics, right? So we can do all of those things. Okay. And with that. <coughs> Um, I, I'd like to uh, thank Chi, uh, excellent. Um, I also would uh, like to let you know that um, we actually have an organization uh, within SAP the Center of Excellence that will connect you with other public sector customers that are doing big data projects so that you can talk to them and direct them. Uh, because quite frankly, um, hey, I'm a sales guy when it's the bottom at, at the end of the day. So uh, I, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you positive things, and I'll try and tell you as, as honestly as I can, but it's never as honest as it, as it is in another time. Um, one of the things that uh, some of the people in the room today are actually from Department of Water Resources, and if I could get to stop chuckling, uh, back there about about that last remark, he, uh, he actually is one of my companies, and uh, they've actually uh, uh, um, undertaken a big data uh, uh, project, and um, we actually just recently, in the last three months, completed a proof of concept to them. So they are a resource here, what right within the state, they can answer questions for you. Um, and, you know, and, and just call, I'll give you Tim's cell phone number, and yeah, you can call them direct. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, we want to get anybody else angry in the household. Um, but anyway, they're, they're a great resource, and they can also they can answer the questions, like I said, both the good and the bad. Um, and they're actually here in the room today, so if anybody has any questions that they'd like to direct to them, please ask. Uh, you can ask those questions as well. Um, if you have any questions of Chi or any of the things that we presented today, please raise your hand. You can go from there. Anybody have any questions? Uh oh. We, we, we ended up in the All right, so I'll, I'll stick around as well afterwards in case anyone wait, has any questions afterwards. Go ahead. specific question about HANA, what is HANA? Is it hardware, is it software? So HANA is an appliance. So what that means is that SAP provides the software, but it's highly tied to the hardware. So there are, but it's not a appliance model in the sense that, you know, like a Teradata, you have a single vendor, which is Teradata that provides you both software and hardware, you're locked in the hardware. So it's not like that. So it is software that's highly tuned to the hardware platform. And so, but you as a customer, can choose to buy the hardware, the certified models from pretty much all the major vendors, HP, IBM, Cisco, and so on, right? They all provide certified models, right? So that, that's a deployment model. But you know, you can say, you know what? You know, I'm going doing a cloud initiative. So I actually don't want to buy on-premise. So we also provide hosting solutions through SAP directly, as well as through our hosting partners. So you can say, I want to do have a heavy hosting solution as well. Yeah, question? So. So it depends, right? So we have a customers where, for example, we have very large Teradata customers where we don't just go in and say, oh, we'll replace Teradata, right? We don't go and say, that's, that's too complex. Rather, we say, okay, you know what? You already have, let's say, a Teradata or Exadata. 
we will coexist and we will help you identify scenarios where you need acceleration or there's something that you cannot possibly do today for whatever reason in those platforms, right? And where so then we would just ingest data and that data warehouse will be a particular uh, OVIA data source. We also have areas where you know, the customers are starting a new business, uh, new data warehouse uh, initiative where we are the solution as well. Right? So we have kind of both, both, uh, both scenarios for our customers. Yes. Ah, that's a great question. So how do I get data if I have a bunch of you know, Teradatas and Oracles and DB2s and whatever, right? So that's a great question. So actually we have a variety of tool sets for all the right, depending on the scenario. So let me just quickly kind of go down the laundry list of those. Right? So first there's ETL, right? So SAP has, we have our own data service, uh, our ETL tool called data services that originally came from business objects, but you're not locked into that, right? You may say, you know, I'm a data stage customer or I'm a, uh, a Informatica customer. Right, so they all those other tools also work upon us. So that's the ETL based approach. Then the second one is two different replication approaches. Right, so one first replication approach is that if you have let's say Oracle hypothetically, you can set up a trigger based replication. So the way we have a mechanism for that. But if you say I don't want to set triggers on my physical on my source database, that's too heavyweight. I don't believe in that. We also have log based approaches. Right, so we have our own tool for to do log uh, to do log based replication from supported databases, which is all the major relational databases. And then we have a third approach, which is data virtualization. Is that? And so for this, and that, the sources include Hadoop, as well as today, Teradata, and Oracle, and SQL Server, and DB2 will be the next release, where what you're doing is that you're setting up a connection to the remote source, and everything is done on the fly. So what you're doing, you as a DBA, you're gonna say, I'm gonna set up a virtual source that is, let's say, a Oracle database, right, at this IP address, right? And I'm gonna set up a virtual table that is my uh, let's say, you know, health, health records table that's residing in Oracle. And, and, and so once I've set that up, any of my HANA users treat that just like an actual real HANA table, right? So it doesn't look any different. So you can say, I want to do a three-way join of that Oracle healthcare table with a master data, master customer table that is residing in HANAs and five other tables in right SQL or whatever, right? And so what happens is that at runtime, the query optimizer, query optimizer will actually get statistics from Oracle to figure out what is the right way to process your particular query and you know, to do the right thing to minimize the amount of computation as well as to minimize the amount of data transfer. Uh, so the, so it's, 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 uh, and it's gonna depend on the way your landscape is set up and also the network bandwidth, but in terms of um, uh, so ETL, as you know, right, ETL is not real time, right? So ETL, your micro batching is probably going to be a, at best a few seconds. Right? If you're talking about the trigger based replication, I think that's about one, as well as the, the log based uh, replication, those are all probably sub second. Right? And then the virtualization approach, that's really, I can't give you an answer because that depends on what is the query that you're executing on the source, right? How fast is it, is it, does it take for the source to execute that query? And how much data you are trying to fetch that, that's transferred over the wire? That's actually a great point because uh, during the proof of concept that we did at DWR, we actually were finding that the, um, one of the latency points was actually the, 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 the where we were trying to connect. It, you know, so the actually the architecture is very important, um, and what you're trying to problem that you're trying to solve is, is important. 